David Ito, Chief Instructor of the Aikido Center of Los Angeles. With me is... Bill D'Angelo. And Mike Van Ruth. And Stan Sung. Black belt. What does it mean? What is it? A black belt. It's just a thing that, as Mr. Miyagi said, no need, <laughs> no need, to, no need rope to hold up your pants. <laughs> Well, I, I think as as a beginner, when you're starting out, you kind of look up to the black belts as being this this uh, ideal or whatever it might be. And then when you finally get your black belt, all that hard work, and you find out uh, there's just more work to, to, do. to do. There's no there there. And it's like it kind of takes away from the mysticism a little bit, and you realize eh, it's just a, another level signified by something I'm wearing around my waist. But there's no stopping, and what you because people, a lot of people out there think once I get black belt, I'm done. That isn't the case. That is never the case. It keeps on going. Well, look, I guess the question is why do you, why did you want to become a black belt? Well, I think <laughs> for a selfish reason, I thought, dang, those hakamas are cool, <laughs> and then yeah. you have to wear it, and you're like, damn, this thing's hard. It's hot, and it's it's hard to move around in. And it's like. Yeah, I kind of lost luster real I, quick. I think when you're really young, like I think when I was in like high school, there's there's this there's this myth about what a black belt means. And I think when I was really young, what a black belt meant was was martial art proficiency. Hmm. That's what I thought. That's what I thought it meant. Like when I started training in martial arts, that's what I thought a black belt meant. It meant like you could defend yourself. I don't think that's what it means, but that's what I thought it meant when I first started. Well, I thought it meant you can kick butt. Exactly. That's, <laughs> no. But that's the same thing. It, yeah. meant, it meant that you were going to be <laughs> able to take care of yourself. Well, I um, thought of it more when it got a black belt. I could be the bully, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then it turns out that you know that was, that was more of a elementary way of looking at it. But yeah, it turns out that you know once we. I get it, but it's a matter of yeah, knowing that you have the ability to defend yourself. And it's almost as if once you do get it, it's like inside you, you're like, there's that bit of you going, I'm not worthy of this. You know, there's like, I, I really have to stand up and, and represent this thing because you never feel like you're worthy of the promotion you got. Yeah, I remember the first experience I had hearing about a black belt was on Happy Days. Really? really? There was a guy who was... Is that the a, Tom Hanks? I'm not sure if the Tom Hanks, but I remember there was an episode of Happy Days where this guy was a black belt and his hands were registered oh, at the yeah. police department. Oh, yeah. And that, For you think, sure. You know, his hand, these, these hands are deadly weapons registered at the police department. And you're like, that's kind of cool. <laughs> and then, you know, once I did martial arts, I was like, oh, that's not what it is at all. And it's like, a black belt doesn't mean anything. Especially being at Fruit Dojo. Black belt right. didn't mean anything. No, it just means you, you're expected to work harder now. You have more responsibility. Yeah, and more responsibility. I also remember when we were all coming up at, at our dojo, it seemed like most of the students were black belts For in the 90s. It seemed like at least half. I'm not really sure because in the 90s, I was already a black belt. By, by like 1993, I was already yeah. a black belt. But I to me, it was it was just this thing where... I, I remember before I, before I was a black belt, someone goes, hey, uh, you going to stay for advanced class? And I was like, uh, what is that? And they, <laughs> they said, you're staying. And I went, huh? And then people just thrashed me. And I was like, what? And then every time it was like, so you're staying, right? And you're like, uh, I don't think I want to <laughs> stay. <laughs> you had to stay. There was no, you like, yeah. you, you were now indoctrinated into advanced class and people were like, and they didn't teach you how to break fall. They just threw you. Really hard. And then you were expected to figure out br break fall. That handshake break fall that people do today, we didn't start doing it right away. People right. just grabbed you and threw you down. And you're like, oh. And then you're like, I better learn how to like do that break fall thing so I don't hurt myself. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, for me, it's like this. It just, I don't, I never thought of black belt as like, a, like man, when I get to black belt, I'm going to be so tough. Right. Because I was just like, you know, maybe it's because, you know, Ken and, Ken, Ken and some other people got black belt in two years. I got mine in three. Right. And so there wasn't a whole lot of time when you're like, oh, I wish I was a black belt, you know. And like when I was a white belt, and I think I got second Q twice 
first hmm. queue like two or three times and then you you see your name on the board and you're like but i think i'm already right but then there, you, you did not want to go to sensei and be like hey uh i think you made a mistake <laughs> 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 no, that wouldn't have gone over very well at all. No. Well, but I mean that the, that's the that's the question like where if it doesn't mean anything, right? And it's an, only a construct, uh, you know, of the early 19th or 20th century, then why do people do it today? Why yeah. why is it why is it necessary at all for training? Well, I think it's something it's a, it's a perceived destination. So yeah. you it's something that allows you to keep, wants that motivates you to keep to push to keep pushing yourself to try to get better and then along the way somewhere along the way you get to that spot where it is no longer meaningful to you anymore it's like anything else physical buy that new car buy the new house you get the house you get the car now you want something else you want a bigger house better car yeah right? so it's a perceived destination man i, mean, I kind of analogize it to education i mean in our whole lives in education you go through elementary school you go through middle school you go through high school then if you keep going, go to college, graduate school, professional school, and black belt sort of mirrors that experience in the sense that you, if you go through your Q ranks, you go through black belt, and if you decide to keep going on, there's, at least my understanding, at least in our dojo, is you have first degree, second degree, and then some of the higher level black belts have different meanings, or at least that's how it's, ex it's been explained to me, that you have certain technical proficiency, teaching proficiency. You know, maybe we could talk a little bit about that, but... My understanding is that it does have some similarities to how our, our education systems work. Um, like when you go to college, that that's a basic level of education. But if you go on to become a graduate student uh, or professor, then that gives you the ability to teach at a higher level or to participate in business or other studies at a higher level. Mm -hmm. So that's one way that I think of it, that achieving those things are, it's a recognition of what you've learned. And then it may also be a recognition of your ability to sometimes teach or to explain the art. Uh, so I think it has, for me, it has some analogies to the other yeah. things that we do in society. Well, that, and that's where you can, you can look at uh, Homer Dojo's grading system and analyze it in that sense. So if you look at like all the Q ranks and Shodan and Nidan, those are all merit ranks. Serve your time take the test, no matter how badly you do on the test, you should pass because you've served your time. Because Shodan, show means to begin, right? Uh, Sandan and Yondan, those are technical ranks. If you look at, if you just look at the way Aikikai sets up their um, rating system. And then uh, fifth on and above, those are teacher ranks, right? So when you're at Shodan, uh, Nidan and Q ranks, all you're really doing is memorizing the moves. So if you think of this idea of shu hari, this this how you develop yourself in Japanese traditional arts, shu is like this basic thing where you learn and copy and master the master the movement. Ha is where you really look at the details, and ri is where where you break the details or break it up, you break the form, right? And so, but there's like shu shu ha 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 and ri 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 ri, but everyone thinks it's just one two three, but it's not. But if you look at Shuhari, it really does fit in well with the Aikikai grading system. And I'm not sure if Aikikai did that on purpose, but like for Q ranks and Shodan and Nidan, you have to memorize and become proficient in those technical basic details. And then from, you know, like uh, third and fourth is really, really to start to kind of go, well, then why is this here? What happens if my foot goes there? But what happens if this is different? And then once you move into like fifth on, you're like l really learning how to teach people. You know, and it's not like today where, you know, a guy who's like a, a brown belt or first or first degree black belt can just teach people. That never happened in the past. Hmm. In the old days, you had to, if you were going to become a teacher, you had to begin in children's class. N not taking it, but teaching it. Because children are, the, are harder to teach than adults. adults. And then you kind of learn patience, you learn all these different things. And then you move on to teaching a beginner in the in a, in a, in an adult class. And then you learn... Then you start assisting an adult class, and then you take over an adult's class. So if you look at this idea of shuhari, um, it f fits very, very nicely into the Aikikai grading system. But most people don't really. What's the real? What's the biggest difference between first degree and fifth degree? Time served is probably the biggest one, but your ability to analyze is, is a, uh, what the calls it aiki iq look at a technique and go uh this is what's wrong with it 
Or look at a technique and go, well, that won't work because of this, 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 and this. Right? But, but really, there's really no difference but time served. Mm. But that's the thing. But you, everybody wants to advance up the ladder. So the bad thing about Aikido is that you can play the game and I'll go over here and I'll get showed on. And then I'll leave that person and go over here and suck up to this person and get kneed on. And, I'll, and then I'm going to leave him and I'll go over here because he's my friend and he'll get me sawned on. And then you, you just go around collecting black belts and then in 10 or 15 years, you're a fifth degree black belt, which shouldn't happen. You honestly, I mean, this is just me, you know, saying things, but... You really shouldn't get fifth degree black belt till you've been doing Aikido for at least 20, 20 years. But there are people that have a, such a meteoric rise. You're like, th there was a guy on Facebook. I saw that he he said, "I'm celebrating my twentieth year in Aikido," and I'm and and he's sixth on. And I was like, "Wait, how, how are you? How is it possible that you're celebrating your twentieth year and you're sixth on?" You know, you think, oh well, you know, someone gifted them those ranks. Well, maybe he went every day for this for you know all those years for twenty years. But even Watanabe Sensei, he trained almost every day for 18, 18, years. 18 or nineteen years, and he got he was he got to the level of fifth on, and he got his black belt in two years. Yeah, right. And he was free Sensei's Uchideshi. So when you think about a, when I think about a black belt, I don't. It's just as Mr. Miyagi said. It is just. So you don't need a rope to hold up your pants. And the reason why I think that way is because when I was in elementary school, there was this dude who in like the fifth or sixth grade was a black belt in karate. And then he, oh, and he was a little guy, he had a huge chip on his shoulder, you know, like you know, he's like that short guy in school where he's always like, what'd you say to me? And you're like, and then he did karate. And so one day someone called him out and <clears throat> So, of course, they're going to fight in front of everyone in the quad. And he gets down low, gets into a, a stance, starts doing a kata. And then the guy just punches him in the face and, and beats, his, beats him up. So, throughout my uh, elementary school, high school, uh, junior high and high school, I saw that same scenario happen all the time. Where they go, oh, that guy is from Japan. He lived in, he, he, you know, this, this Japanese guy, he's from Japan. Yeah, he's a black belt in karate. And then they're fighting behind the Federated in, in Temple City. And, like, you go, okay. And then you're like, I don't know the guy. And I'm watching. And the guy takes his shoes off. And you're all, <laughs> And then he just gets wasted by some guy. And you're all, that black belt wasn't worth much. And so <laughs> several times throughout my young adulthood, there were people that were black belts that just got destroyed by yeah. street fighters and so, so I the whole illusion of black belt was kind of just shattered in your yeah. formative years yeah i would say so so i never i never really thought like oh man i gotta get me a black belt i went eh, what are they really were they just <laughs> see them getting, people getting beat up you know but like that's the hard part like but there was a guy one city over who was a black belt in some uh, korean martial art and he he was a gr he was in he was probably like six feet tall and like 250, Chi uh, Korean guy. And he got into a lot of fights. But every time I saw him fight, he never used uh, karate. He like hit the guy a couple times and then he would just body slam him. And then um, they'd be rolling around on the ground. And I'm like, but why don't you just use your karate or whatever, whatever you're, they call it in Korean martial arts? But he never did. But I mean, that's the hard part. We think, what does a black belt really mean? You know, it's like... Uh, and that's why, like in the Aikikai system, you don't really, you can't get black belt until you're a certain um, age, mm -hmm. no matter how, how long you've been training. But you see people all the time. I mean, sometimes I think of it from the, I see an example like from the completely other side of the spectrum, which you and I have talked about. If you, I think maybe the, the three of us have talked about it, is that video, the documentary done in Japan um, about the kendoists that are near the end of their career that are testing for eighth dawn. Yeah, where they've been doing kendo for 60 years, 50 years. And the pass rate for 8th Dawn is, I think, like less than one-tenth of 1% 1 every year that it's offered. Yeah, it's yeah. A, uh, one point. It's like point one, one five or something. Yeah, some insane zero low point, number. 0.15. And, and then the question there is, what is, what is being represented by the achievement of your 8th eighth, eighth degree black belt in kendo? Like... What does it mean to achieve that rank? 
with such a high standard and that people are willing to practice for maybe a decade to have the chance to potentially achieve that rank. Well, in that, in that video, there was a guy who had taken it 12 times? Yeah, something like that. Over a decade and of I attempts. He didn't, in, the, in the video, he didn't pass. But there was a yeah. guy who took it three times and passed. But, like, you you have to show, like, such a high level of technical ability that you can't just get by with winning the match. Like, right. Even if you win, you're still, you're, you, you, that still may not be enough to get you that black belt. But, like, that's, that's a very Japanese... Japanese an older way of doing things. Today, I don't know. It would be interesting to see how many people are still challenging that test, mm. how, how many people are still passing that test. Because in America, I think there was one. One the, American had done it? I think Maki Miyahara Sensei. The, I studied at Kendo under him. There might be a couple now. Maybe even Shikai Sensei might be. I don't, know, don't quote me on that. But I know that like for the longest time, it was Maki Miyahara Sensei was the only eighth on in America because it was such a hard thing to get. But, you know, how does an organization survive? They survive by having money. And so how do they get money? Uh, student, student registration and testing. Oh, well, maybe merchandising, toys, karate, you know. <laughs> like, but, right, passive income, they get it through ranking. Well, one of the other reason I brought this example up is some Do Japanese martial arts have dual tracks for promotion. One, like in judo, you can go competition track or non-competition track for promotion. Um, but Aikido, there's only one, there's test, well, there's testing. Um, but I, when I was thinking about that, that, that kendo uh, exams, they're, my understanding from watching the video was they're, they're tested, but it's not, it doesn't seem like the, the outcome, like you said, the outcome of the competition doesn't seem to be what's tested. No, the yeah, the out, not the outcome, but were you? Did you um, embody you, the spirit? Well, spirit, but were you impetuous? Mm. Did, were you calm? Uh, what level of move did you use? Those are all things that weigh into the test. So, do you think there's anything analogous from that in the way that higher ranks are tested in Aikido, or is it not? Is, is there any similarity? There is not. There's and not. There should be, but. In Aikido, you uh, there's two tracks in Aikido. You can get a rank by testing for it, or you can get it by recommendation. But f fifth on and above is by recommendation. Mm -hmm. So, unfortunately, a lot of it's you have to know someone who's one or two ranks higher than you that's willing to recommend you for that rank. Okay. So, but that's where that's where the uh, it opens up into you know politics. politics and mistakes like the discussion we're having about the kendo test and how it might be analogous to aikido i know you and i talked about before this was the one article that sensei wrote about the meaning of the black belt he talked he talked a lot in that article about um the spirit of um shodan or just black belt in general he talked mm -hmm. a lot about that and there didn't seem to be in that article much discussion about technical proficiency. There seemed to be a lot of discussion about humility, um, taking care of others, um, and I wonder whether that also s sort of seemed to be parallel to some of the ideas that were in the, the Kendo test. Well, but that's the thing is that if you can develop the those personal characteristics, then that shows your level. Mm. Right. If you can, if you can develop compassion, true compassion, that shows your level, and then supposedly your I, your physical ability will mirror your inner development. Yeah. Right. So if you're a person who's kind of a jerk, or a person who has a lot of anger issues, your your um, outward ability and your inward ability will ma will mirror the two and so but then see that's the hard part it seems to be very uh, subjective oh mike is a nice guy he's been with me for 20 years oh i'll give him fifth on oh he quits oh oh my gosh he's such a jerk oh i made a mistake right and that's that's the whole thing is that the teacher is supposed to be trying to bring out the true you throughout your entire training so they go oh they wait they do things to you wait do things to you and then they want to see who you really are because some people are very, have very good parents, and their parents polish them so where they sit, yes, madam, please, 
yes, no problem. But, but then when no one's watching, they're like picking their nose and doing all these things. So the teacher is waiting and waiting, waiting for the real you to come out. Hmm. 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 And then sometimes doing something to elicit a response. Testing, in a sense. Uh, pushing you. Push like, probing. <laughs> probing. When, when I was a, a white belt, maybe even a black belt, I can't really remember. But since he said, oh, David, he has an anger, he has a, a temper. And I had never shown my temper in the dojo. Never. And I do have temper. But I had never shown it in the dojo. But since he call, called it, he's like, oh, yeah, David's got a, he's got a really bad temper. And then, oh, shoot, here it is, you know. But, like, that's the thing is that, like, the teacher waits and waits and waits and tries to provoke you, probe you, to get you to let the real you come out. Because then when the real you comes out, that's when the real training begins, right? So that's why some of it, fit the physicalness, is just designed to get you into shape. But it's really they're trying to see what point you're going to quit, what point you're going to give up, what point are you going to start becoming a jerk, what, what point are you going to start the real you going to come out. And then they go, oh, okay, you got to stop doing that. And whatever it is. Or, you, you know, like maybe you're very a person who's very scared or fearful or something. And then they go, okay, now you have to try this thing, right? And so, like, sometimes, <clears throat> like on some one person's black belt test, I made this person um, take uh, Toastmasters for a year. Because I found out that he was scared to talk in public. And I was like, oh, thank you for telling me that. So you're going to take <laughs> Toastmasters for one year as part of your black belt Yikes. requirement. What? Yeah, because I, I I realized, oh, that person got to think, okay. And then you help them along. You know? what, do you, what do you think about, I was, you, know, you were talking about Toastmasters and people's fears um, about students that don't want to advance in rank after they, let's say, achieve like first on or showed on that that just decide that they don't want to test anymore or but do they don't want to test or they don't want rank in general maybe it's the same question well if they don't want rank we don't have to have they don't have to have rank if they don't want to test they don't have to test but they can't want rank and not want to test yeah. or or do something which like one of my secret requirements, I probably shouldn't say this here, is that if I find out someone went to Vipassana meditation retreat, like a 10-day silent meditation retreat, in my mind, I'm all, that person got showed on. They just have to serve their time. Because that will is so hard, hard to get yeah. through. You can't get through it without, without it affecting you. And I think, oh, that's harder than a black belt test. Yeah, you could take it. And in my mind, I go, yeah, that person will be ready. Right, but that's the hard part, right? If you, if I just give these people, and that's the old, the, the it happened to Furious Sensei. He gave people ranks, and then their heads went, I can know, I know Aikido, I'm so, and you go, whoa, man. Hmm. You know, and you go, oh, shoot, Sensei should have never given that person that rank. But they gave them rank um, to thank them for something that they had done for the dojo or something like that, but then their heads just went, boom. And you're like, whoa. I thought you whoa had okay. a negative effect on their ego. Mm. It brought out their true self. Mm. Yeah. Well, I can speak to what Bill's comment also being showed on and having, I guess, taken a pass on tests multiple times. Then I, I'd say I'm speaking for myself. The yeah. Combos that I really don't care about the rank. And so Why? Why is that? I just want to get good, regardless of the rank. Yeah. I didn't think that I need the rank to get good, so I just want to train to train as opposed I, I didn't need the rank to, to represent how good yeah. I am you know um, and that's a personal journey that I have then as long as I know I'm good then I didn't care about having yeah. another belt to show it off but that's personal so but I don't know if everybody feels that way I can see how somebody would just not want to test even though they want rank but then they're just afraid of testing because they're afraid of failing or whatnot, but I can see those scenarios. I can put myself in those shoes. And that's fine. Like, if the person lets me know, hey, I have test, test anxiety, but then if they told me that, I'm all, you're going to test. I'm going to figure out a way to make this person <laughs> test for it yeah. without yeah. them realizing that they're testing for it or something like that. But, like, that's the hard part that um, I don't, gosh, many, 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 many of the people that, for instance, a gifted rank to ruin them. You know, and so today I go, and then even me, 
I've gifted ranked as people and it ruined them. And I'm like, oh man, I shouldn't have done that. But how do you? How are you to to know, to know until, ahead of time until it comes out and you go, poo, that person thinks a lot of themselves, you know. But that's the problem with, you know, when I was uh, when I was a student, I was just like Stan. I didn't care about rank. All I wanted to know is, can you do it? And then whoever, like, if uh, another black belt came in the dojo, I'd be like, party time. Time's on. Let's try this guy on. See what he's got. Exactly. Or <laughs> since he said, oh, this guy's coming. He's fifth on. I was like, I'm going to get to see what a fifth on feels like. And then I'd be all over him and stuff. <laughs> like a total jerk, you know. But um, <laughs> but that's, that's, you know, that that's the right path to be on. Right, that you're doing it to, to to develop yourself, not to not to like I know this this person that all he does is accumulate rank, rank and and accolades. He needs to win. He needs to win um, awards at work. He needs to gain martial arts ranks. He he's collected uh, college degrees, and you think, oh, that person's hoping that one of those will somehow fulfill them. Yeah, but it doesn't, right? Because it's just an external thing. You could buy buy your rank on the. Inter- just make it on Photoshop. No one mm-hmm. will know the difference. So foolish people scan, uh, take pictures of their Shodan, Nidan, Sandan ranks and put them on their Facebook page. You just take a snapshot of that, make that in Photoshop, boom, you're fourth on. Computers are great. Computers are great. No one, <laughs> no one but that's because that's the thing. Nobody cares. But like what Stan was saying, it's the proof is in the pudding. Right. Whether right? you can do it or not. The hard part about like not not achieving the rank up to like Sandan is like there are certain times where, like, Doshi will do a, cla- a special class in Iwama for Sandan and, you and need above. A rank. Mm-hmm. So you have to have rank to get there or, you know, ask for a special dispensation or something. And so that would be the only reason why you would need the rank. But you don't need the rank. Right. The proof is in the pudding, right? So, like, one time I was playing pool at this, at this restaurant, and my buddies bring this guy up to the table, and they go, this guy – Hey man, this guy's a black belt in karate, and I go, oh, that's nice. I'm playing pool, and the guy's like, oh, you're you're a black belt in uh, aikido, and I said, yeah, and he goes, Psh, like that, and then his he had his hand on the table, and I go, I, I rub his knuckles, and I go, S- a lot of peaks and valleys there, buddy. Doesn't seem like you do karate at all. He pulls his hand away, looks at me, and just walks away. Wow. Because if you do a striking arm, and these two, these first two knuckles are nice, nice and sharp. That means you never hit somebody before. And so I just rubbed them off. These <laughs> these two knuckles got lots of peaks and valleys. Doesn't look like you do karate at all. And then he was like shamed and pulled his hand away and just walked away. You know, because he, he couldn't say because he can't. We oh, oh aikido. You, you know, he there would be no way for him to read me like like I read yeah. him. Mm-hmm. But it like I mean, he ripped his hand out of my hand and just. <gasps> And just turned around and walked away because he was he either knew that he was found out or that uh, you know he knew that he wouldn't be able to do anything because he wasn't you know maybe he was or wasn't that rank but for someone to say that you know like that that's what i look for and but you see like that's the thing is like if you're if you search for rank you'll get rank but if you search to, to develop yourself you will develop yourself so you have to yeah when you're facing off someone you have to read them in like a second. You can't go, well, he looks like he does jujitsu. He looks like he does karate. He looks like a boxer. No, you have to be able to look at them and ascertain their level and style right away. How they're standing. You have to look at things like how they're standing, uh, what their posture is like, and then you look at things like their Hands. their knuckles. If these knuckles are flattened, you know that person's put some time in on the makiwata. So you think, eh, that person probably punches pretty hard. Okay, I better not get punched in the face. If that guy gets in a really low stance and starts shifting his hip, you're thinking, this guy's going to try to kick me. If this person gets in a kyphotic uh, crouch, you think this person's a wrestler or a judo person going to try to take me down. So you have to be able to read them. So like one time I was with this guy and we went to meet his his Hapkido master. And we go in there and he's like, this old Korean guy talking like this. Not to meet you. And I was like, oh... And he, sh- I shook his hand, and his hand, it looked like there were two quarters inserted under oh. his skin. I mean, they were like, they were so flat. And I was like, dude, like, your teacher's got, he's like, yeah, he does he, like these, he does these, um, these push-ups on his knuckles every day. And he's like freaking 60-something years old. And I was like, dude, I don't want to get ever punched by that dude, right? Because he, 
he put some time and energy into making his fist into a deadly weapon. Mm -hmm. So does it matter if that guy's black belt? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? No. No. You look at that person and think, I ain't messing with him. Yeah, I don't get hit by that guy. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I think that, I mean, I, I analogize this to other things I've done in my life, like like climbing or sailing, where uh, it's it's strict competition. Or even like something like climbing, which doesn't have to be competition, but whether you're able to climb something of a certain difficulty or not, the mountain wins. Like, you either are able to make it up or you're not. And you're not ranked. You, no one's giving you an external rank. The, the experience tests you. And I sometimes would think to myself, like, you know, um, someone could say you might be an expert at something, but um, the experience, it's, it's completely your own self-development. Um, and I, I sometimes would wonder, like, I would talk to people who do these things, and there's clearly, uh, like, levels of expertise, but there's no ranking. Hmm. And sometimes I think about that. And that makes me think about um, martial arts ranking, that it it does represent the um, what we were talking about earlier, that it represents understanding about, like you were saying, the shuhari, that there's a certain level of understanding of technique, and then the ability to understand at a higher level which techniques work and how to teach them. Like I just I always keep coming back to that because maybe it's just because I've I've been an educator at universities and and have an analogous experience, but uh, for me I think it, it it does keep coming back to that because it's changed for me over time. Um, but I think that because Aikido doesn't doesn't um, have like matches it's not and then that's such a key part of aikido we talked about that in the early one of the early podcasts that that's mm. not something that aikido ever wants to do it's it's like, you know second doshu talks about how that's a key part of aikido that I, we are non-competition right because the the competition is so fake and ephemeral in that one moment you were lucky enough to get that shot off which knocked that person out which got you this thing which doesn't mean anything Right. But then, so the other day I was at Disneyland with my kids, right? And my kids are young. And so they want to go everywhere. They're doing all these things. And the trams aren't working. So you have to walk from the <laughs> parking lot to Disneyland and back again, right? So there's this point where we had been out and we'd already walked 22,000 steps, <sighs> right? And you're like, oh, I got to walk back to the car, right? And think, man, you got to suck it up, buttercup. And you, you you go okay let's go and the kids are all ah, carry me and you're like I can't I can, you know I can only carry them for like <laughs> another know, mile ten, two miles. they're not feet. small anymore yeah they're not small. and but in, in that moment if you give up or you don't give up that's who you truly are right right so it doesn't matter if if you were if if you won the the West Coast gold medal championship if you go oh this is too hard and you give up right right so like. That's where you think, oh, well, I have to have competition. Why? You have to have competition so other people know that you're good. Or strong. Right? But right. in the end, when you when you um, got scared and ran away, well, I guess, what does that gold medal do for you? It doesn't do anything for you. It shows, you know, it, it just, it's something to put on the wall so others right. think you're great. The black belt is so you wear that. It, usually we wear it so that others think highly of us but really the black belt is a symbol of responsibility right right but like you know like the, that's the hard part like when we were when i was a student that we used to have this guy who is a, a black belt class ahead of me who was a bouncer at a strip club and, and all these he was a bouncer at various clubs and he would tell us these stories that were so f so funny like he'd be like oh yeah i got in fight with a taekwondo guy last night got in fight with a hapkido guy and i go how do you know he did Taekwondo? He's like, oh, he told me. And then he tells me a story that he's throwing this guy out of the club. And the guy's really wasted, this, this Asian guy. And the guy goes, you can't do this to me. I'm, I'm Master Hoka, you know, top student. Ah, ah, Taekwondo, second-rate black belt. And he just runs in. And my, and my buddy just 
eating knees with his fist up, and the guy just runs right into him, knocks him out cold. And his friend's like, you can't do that. He's a black belt in Taekwondo. And this guy's huge. He's over six feet tall and like 250 Big. pounds. He just goes, I just did. <laughs> and so every like Saturday or Sunday, and I'd see him, I'd go, hey, man. Do you beat anybody up last night? And then he would tell me these stories. Oh, yeah, this guy. And then he would tell me how he used Aikido on some dude. And the um, every once in a while, we would go to a dance club, and he'd be working there. And he'd be he he's the doorman you don't want to mess with. Yeah. He's standing at the door wearing a, a, a suit. He's really big, and he's reading Hagakure. <laughs> like that. If you knew anything about martial arts, you'd walk up and be like, "Oh, yes, hello, sir. Could I get in today?" I mean, why would a bouncer be reading, you know, Hagakure, Hagakure and stuff? And but I, but that was just the funny. He would tell us all these funny stories about about martial artists like um, pushing up on him and then him just blowing Tooling them, them. Yeah. away. And he was a big dude, you know. He's on steroids and all this stuff. But every time I we would say like, oh, but you punch him? No, I just eat him. Eat. Held out my fist and the guy ran right into it. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't punch him at all. And you're like. Damn, that's some crazy stuff. But I mean, he was—he never went past the the um, rank of shonan, you know. But he was crazy. Daily he, active participation. But he did aikido every day with us for three to five years, and man, it was—it was hilarious though when he would tell us these stories about uh, fighting this guy who was a boxer, or fighting this guy who was, who did karate or some type of striking art or fighting this guy who does jujitsu or wrestling and then picking up on body slamming them and so i mean for him like you know what does it mean like the black belt for him didn't mean anything yeah right but that was part of his job yeah yeah i mean that was that was part of his daily job but someone like that having that kind of experience he would be, if being in those different experiences and his aikido technique didn't work you think he would like still you come to class? He wouldn't use it. He wouldn't use it. It would be worthless to him. But in on the, in the same sense, he quit because he, ha he started having all these personal problems. So his black belt did not help him in his daily life. You know, figure out his life and personal problems. So that's that's that hard that hard thing. Like you're six degree black belt in Aikido, but uh, you know. Uh, 20th Q in your regular life because the regular life is all messed up. Yeah. Right. And that's that's where what does it even mean to have a black belt? It doesn't mean anything if it doesn't help you benefit you in life. So you can beat some people up. Whoopity do. And how long does that last? In your 30s? Maybe a little bit in your 40s? But sooner or later, right? Speed, strength, all those things catch up with you. And then you, you know, you got a black eye. What happened? Oh, some guy who's, you know, 20 years old and five foot one freaking punched me in the face. You know, it's like, well, I thought you were a black belt in Aikido. Yeah. Like, it doesn't make a difference, right? Winning and losing, there's a huge <clears throat> element of luck. So, you know, what your color you're wearing around your waist, what color you're wearing around your waist only is there so that to embarrass you. Because if someone beats you up and you go, oh, Stan, I thought you were a black belt in Aikido. And you're like, well, I am. But, uh, <laughs> I, so there's this funny, uh, if you ever seen, I'm not sure if it's Street Fighter 1 or Street Fighter 2 with Sonny Chiba. He's contemplating what to do in this next step against the mob. And he's in this Japanese spa. And some guy's like talking about, oh, I am a karate fifth dawn. And then the mafia breaks into the spa and he starts fighting. Uh, Sonny Chiba is the street fighter, starts fighting all these guys. And this karate guy goes, he goes to fight one guy and he gets knocked out. And he, and he goes, but I'm fifth dawn in karate. As he's, getting, as he's falling down being knocked out. <laughs> right? Because that's that thing. Like what? It's, it's just a number. It's just a color. It, it only means something in that moment when you attain it. But it... it, it if you, if you, it's kind of interesting. They say a white belt, a black belt is a white belt turned black through effort, but then a black belt becomes a white belt through by atrophy. So if you notice, like some some people like um, Doi Sensei and stuff like that, the black belt starts to become white again, mm -hmm. right? So it goes from white becomes black with effort, but through um, you know n disuse and all that stuff in time, it starts to become a white belt again. Yeah. Right, so then that whole idea is that it's all about coming back to the shoshin, right? To that, to that the beginner's mind. But if you really think this black belt it means something, it doesn't mean anything. Well, it, it that's not it, it. That's not true. It it means it's symbolic, 
right? But it doesn't mean you can beat every person up. I've seen plenty of people that were black belts get destroyed in street fights. So in, do you think that do you think that in your time or, or any this is a question for everybody on the table, but since I mean, we've all been doing Aikido for at least over well, I think the three of on this side over twenty years and Stan at least what, fifteen years? Two thousand two. So almost so. almost, yeah, nineteen oh, years. Yeah, nineteen years. So for all of us, like as as like since we started, do we think like the meaning of black belts changed in any meaningful way? Not personally, but just in, in sort of culture that black belt, the idea of a black belt has changed. And I don't know if you hear this, but I occasionally hear the phone ringing sometimes early in the morning, and you're on the phone. I mean, is over time has what the questions people asked about black belt changed? I mean, I think the three of us have definitely answered questions for new students. And have the, the, the number question, one question by a new student is how long does it take to get black belt? And what do you say? It all depends on the person. <laughs> how how long? How long? Will you? What's your dedication level? You know, how many days a week do you plan on coming in? You know, it's there's a lot of variables to reach that. What's your personal, you know, skill and ability? It's not a question you can just answer because then. When they don't reach the black belt at, by that time frame, discouraged. I'm the bad guy, you know. He lied to me. <laughs> well, but that's the hard part with, like, you, if, because, you know, uh, uh, Kano-sensei in Judo created this belt system, he did it so that people would have a, m could mark themselves with milestones. Right. But it became the decline, well, I don't know, is that true? If you, so Kano-sensei did that so that people would have a way to mark their, their development. Right. But then it became a th the thing, right? You know, every day you, you hear some guy, oh, I got my black belt in this, or I got my black belt in that. And I just go, that's nice. You know, or someone goes, and? oh, my friend's a black belt in this. And I go, that's cool. And I just walk away because I just don't care. Right. Right. But like that in the old days, all you got was your menkyo kaiden. Your menkyo is the, your, certificate. Uh, your teaching certificate. You are now eligible to teach this art. But up until that point, you got nothing. Right. And then usually the, the Menkyo only went to the highest ranking heir to the throne student. Everyone else was there to support that person. Right. But then you better hope that that person wasn't crazy <laughs> or, you know, or kind of an idiot. And then, and then, you know, like in the book Musashi by Eiji Yoshikawa uh, that they made into a movie. In the movie, Matahachi steals uh, uh, Sasaki Kojiro's uh, Menkyo from w whatever school of swordsmanship he did. And he pretends he's Sasaki Kojiro. And so he gets things and gets out of trouble by saying he's Sasaki Kojiro. And so that he doesn't have to um, fight people, he unravels, oh, well, he's got, the, he's Teacher got the, the teacher's certificate. Oh, I better not fight this guy, right? It's, a, it's akin to today flashing your 45. What did you say? That's what I thought you said. Nothing, you know. <laughs> this meal's on the house, right? But, like, that's a hard part, right? If you, if you think it's about fighting you're sorely mistaken in that it, it's meaningless yeah right but if you think it's about self-development then yeah it's got a tremendous amount of meaning right but do, but do prospective students still ask you about black belt or is that all the time do they like yeah. what, what kind of questions do they ask yeah but how long does it take is it how long yeah how long is it going to take you how yeah. do i do it well we have this look on this board it has all the techniques oh that seems like a lot and then Dude. some of them are really fast at doing the math. Hey, if I did the every day, they look at the day count. It takes five five years. Yeah, it takes five years, man. But that's the thing. Do you? There are people out there teaching, and there's nothing wrong with this. But there are people out there teaching with two years of Aikido training. Yeah. Like, what are they doing two years? Right. Like, Ken Ken Watanabe Sensei, he did Aikido every day for two years. Sometimes he would take three classes a day. Yeah. And he got his black belt in two years, right? I got my three and change, and I didn't come every day, though. Right. But that's that hard part, right? What did he learn? What can you teach? Right, after a couple of years. Yeah. To, to, what about... Um, so, but, you know, so that's the hard part. Like, if you... What does it really mean? You know, uh, it's the blending of all colors into one become black at the end. Yeah. Or whatever thing that you, you know, some some eloquent person came up with a you know a reason why it's the color is black right but it really means almost nothing right and so it, it but it, it means almost nothing in a in a in the grand scheme it's just something that you go oh well, i pursue that i have that 
you know, but also it's just something to be embarrassed by because if yeah. you get beat up on the street and they go, I did, I just beat up a fifth degree black belt in Aikido, you know, I had to go to the bathroom that day, you know, and like, so I mean, it doesn't, what's the, what's it, what is the worth of it? What's it worth? I mean, it's worth nothing ex from an exterior standpoint, but from an interior standpoint, it means a lot because it means you stuck it out for X amount of years to achieve a goal that, you know, most quit, most never yeah. make it there. Well, I think most people see the black belt as some sort of destination. And I think to each person's point, the I think the black belt's meaningful to the person to that signs it the meeting for themselves. Right. Right. And the problem with a lot is people think it's the final destination, right. which it's not. When you get there and you realize oh, there's many more layers that onion to peel back, this is not the final destination. This is just what I like, what I used to, uh, and analogous to it, is like preparing for a marathon. You're, you're doing all this running, you know, training, getting all prepared for this, for this marathon. And then the day comes where you got to get in the starting blocks. I call that showdown. Because you did all the preparation work for the real business. And that's showdown, the beginning. We're, you're just getting prepped for the real stuff, you know, because in the beginning you're just, oh, I'm trying to figure out what foot's this, that, and then, and then now we can finally get into the technique, analyzing it, breaking it down, and now that, that this is the real journey now. Yeah, and just like a marathon, you get to the end, they give you a, a little medal or something, and then you tell people, and on Tuesday, no one cares. Yeah. <laughs> you go, hey, hey man, I ran the LA Marathon this weekend. They, oh, you finished? Yeah, way to go, Mike. Tuesday, they go, hey, man, I've, dude, no one cares. Yeah. <laughs> right, because it's, it, it's, it's just for you, right? So, I mean, that's the thing. It's like every person assigns their own value to it, but that's the hard part. If your value, you're assigning that value so that you think, oh, okay, every belt I get, the more badder I am, right? And that's, that's where you're wrong. It's like badder. In fact, once you reach a certain level, you realize, wow. How fragile! Oh, my toe! How that one little thing could turn the tide of the fight, and then somebody beats you up that has no no training at all, all because you broke your toe on the on the know, pavement on the pavement, and then because you were in flip flops, and when you got in a fist fight in flip flops, and then the guy has you right. But like that's the hard part. Like you have to people have don't they don't have to, but it would be nice if people realize like training is training. Right. But Stan, I think, made a really good point, which is, because when I saw this a lot before the pandemic, when I used to work a lot with the black belt class, I mean, the black belt training class, was when people are preparing for the exams, like, they up their training intensity. Maybe it's artificial, but a lot of people will up, up their training intensity, and then sometimes that intensity carries over for other people's energy who may not be preparing for the class, for that test. And... Maybe it, maybe that's a little bit artificial, but sometimes I think that when people prepare, that maybe it's like a mind trick that you're doing onto the students that are preparing. But I think sometimes when people start training to prepare, um, it's like a Jedi mind trick that they just get into the, the mental flow of preparing, and then that bleeds off to the people that are working with them, and all of a sudden you have this like um, snowball effect of more people training harder and um, that benefits everybody. Well, yeah, it's a tool, right? Like yeah. you, you, I need help with my black belt test, so I ask Stan to take my Okemi, and then we, he says, okay, I can meet you on Tuesdays and Thursdays a little bit yeah. early, so you guys meet a half hour before class and start going at it, and the you know he can't help but improve by him helping you. Collaborating, mm -hmm. yeah. I think there's an element of gamification with the belt system right so it just breaks it down gives somebody like levels to compete for and to, to work on and uh it kind of yeah turns it into something that's less arduous uh of yeah i totally task. agree i totally agree it takes your mind off it gives you a particular you know focal uh, point yeah focal point and you, you're doing it to get better without without in a certain sense a jedi mind trick right in that in that way but yeah gamification of it and I think too, like um, I think sometimes people need like discrete chunks of things in order to be able to learn. And sometimes, like when when you when you and uh, Watanabe Sensei created the 
the um, the the Q and the um, Don rank uh, group of techniques and put that all together, and people were able to look at that. I think for the people that were testing, or those of us who did test, like being able to figure out, okay, I'll do this chunk and then I'll do this chunk, it it seemed less amorphous and daunting. Like you could you could look at that and say, okay, I can do this and then I can do this and I can do this. And like Stan said, it's like almost like gamification. You can figure out how to do it. Whereas before, I think, you know, before that, it's like you could have a sense of like I have no idea what to do, and it creates a lot of anxiety. You, you can't eat an elephant at well, one sitting. One bite. Yeah. 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 Well, that's the thing. Like you, like Stan's right. There is this gamification where you, you have to do something to try to figure out how to pass the test. Right. So, yeah. like when I was a when I took my black belt test, you know, I I, I did all right on my black belt test, and then um, people said, "Hey, man, um, wh- what did you use to to uh, study?" Study. And I said, "Oh, I made this like this chart with all these things," and they go, "Oh, cool. C- could I have it?" And I said, "Sure." And so this one guy, I gave him, I gave him the, the chart, chart, and then he's walking out of the dojo. And since he says to him, "Hey, uh, y- you better start training for your black belt test," and he goes, "Oh, that's okay. David gave me his oh, cheat no. sheet." Oh no! And then Sensei rips it out of the guy's hand and goes, "David!" <laughs> and then he goes, "You're not allowed to give it to people, you know, because when I took my black belt test, for instance, he said that's the best black belt test I've ever seen." Yeah, you know, but I had, I had figured out how to gamify the test right you know but i still put my time in but then he he forbid me from sharing it from sharing my system method, my system yeah even though now t- now i think about it i gave everyone who's been in black belt after me like that system but yeah you, know, you got to put put it to practice but that's the hard part like you gamify it the heart but you can't the hardest part is you have to get over the 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 fatigue the mm. you have to you as, as you were saying the other day when we were talking about the military like you have to embrace the suck yeah you know and then you have to learn to get over it and that that when I'm walking back with my kids you think oh, it's so far no place to stop because it's it's the tram path so there's no like tables right. or or uh, uh, water stations water, <laughs> none, none of that so the trail have, of tears so you have to gum on or persevere. And then that's that's the thing which gets you to the place where you need to be, is your per, is perseverance, perseverance in the face of some obstacle that seems like it's um, unsurmountable. And then you right. think, okay, I'm gonna do it. And then you keep going. And you're like, oh my god, this is so hard. All right, just keep going, just keep going. And then you go, oh, I got through. I mean, but that's the hard part is that, and that's why the the two most dangerous times in a person's career is third Q and third dawn. Mm. Because at third Q, you have this, you get this fatigue. Everyone gets this weird fatigue at, during the test. No, no, just just in your training. Third Q is where the most people quit. Well, in this dojo, maybe not other dojos. And then when you're getting ready for third dawn or your third dawn is where you end up quitting, because you just think, I don't, I just it's too is, much. This is good enough, man. I got third third degree black belt. Well, man, this is hard, and I don't want to keep going and all these things because you don't, you didn't get to that level where you you have surpassed what sense he could do to you hmm. like so there was a, there was a time where since he got super mad at us and he said he told mark t to, to teach the class and he said only ukemi f- rolling so mark did all these different things break fall little rolls big rolls jumping rolls and thing and then i was i just laughed <laughs> so easy and then people were, ah, ah, die and i was just like this is, e- this is not punishment for me i can roll really well and my fitness level is high, so rolling's nothing, right? It'd be different. But, it, you know, since he would have said, they got to do push-ups, that would have been, then I would have probably got my butt kicked. But that's the thing. Like, you have to get to a place where you just go, oh, this is just rolling. Oh, this is just the test. You just, and I've prepared myself. What's the big deal? Right. But, like, you you know, like I said, when I was on the Trail of Tears going back to our car in Disneyland, mm-hmm. I was all, whoo, it's harsh, you know, but. You, you learn how to persevere. Yeah, I mean, my recollection of the the black belt test that I've taken is that uh, the the physical, well, the the combination of the physical and the the mental endurance is was what I remember taking away was when my body started to feel like it was done. 
um, that my my mind was being pressured, um, and it, those experiences are still very um, imprinted on me. I mean, years later, I still remember them. Uh, I don't want to say fondly, but you know, ha having lived through them. I mean, there's other arduous experiences I've had in life, but those definitely were experiences that uh, you know. I think that especially in our dojo, going all the way back to the very beginning, I mean, there's always been experiences here and even just the messages that we see, you know, I'm trying to remember the quote right, but it's like, you know, I can only make per one person happy, a, a, you know, a day, today's not your day, tomorrow doesn't look good, the next day doesn't look good either, you know, just train, this sort of sense that, um, like you said, never giving up is sort of what you're, you're being tested on. Um, in your daily training and the tests and the tests you might take in the future. Um, and that to me almost seems like the biggest message or the, the biggest teaching of, of a black belt because it's the most transferable to your regular life because your whole life is, um, is being tested about not giving up. Because if you give up in life, um, you resign yourself to accepting things that are, are bad. Well, that's, the, that's that thing, right? Like you, when you take your test, let's say you're getting ready for your Shodan test. It's really, really important, the techniques that you develop because there's some weird thing that happens that solidifies in the student once they've passed through to show, you know, first degree black belt, Right. that something solidifies. And if they didn't apply themselves, then that laziness is solidified. Shows through. You know, and that, that's the hard part, that those things that happen to you in your test is designed to make, force you because you're so tired to turn off your mind. Right. And when you turn off your mind is when the technique just soaks up into your body. But it's really hard for people to learn that. And so the test yeah. pushes you because you're so tired and working on it. And then when you take the test, your body just clicks into this mode where it just gets it done. And interestingly enough, like when I was a black belt, when I was a first degree black belt, the painfulness of how Free Sensei conducted testing you had to come to class all the time to train for, your black, train for your black belt. If you felt like you weren't training um, enough, hard or enough for your black belt, name came off the list. Yeah. If you felt like you were taking it too lightly, name came off the list. So then the day, the week of the test, you had to come to like every class. Right. You had to come to Friday night class. You had to come to all the Saturday classes. You had to come to Sunday class, and at the end of Sunday training is when you had the black belt. You test. had the black belt test. Yeah, so when you're, you're maximum exhaustion. So, and then in that time, when you were a black belt candidate, everyone beat you. Yeah, up. you were just trashed. You're, you're. It was th that was the goal is to beat every that person up that was a black belt yeah. candidate. Put him through the gauntlet before the test. <laughs> well, wasn't like first Q. The year as your first queue going into your black belt test, it was black belts was open season on first queue, right? And was well at that time it was open season on everyone because it was like the dojo free dojo was, was like uh, gladiators arena. arena. Yeah. But and I remember his first queue. I mean, I felt like I felt like cannon fodder every day. I showed up as first queue. I was like uh, like a punching bag. Yeah, I and, did. That's how I felt. His first queue, and then and then like a punching bag ever since that first day I joined. <laughs> <laughs> But that's the thing is, and then when you got your black belt, then they still punch your ticket too. Yeah, you know. But like that's the hard part. Like you're, you represent Aikido. You represent all these th different things when you get a black belt. So if you, you know, and Fru Sensei was very much about that type of um, training. Training where like you, you represent Osente. You represent Aikido. You represent represent him. You represent Fru Dojo. So there were no, you had to be in. There's right. no out. There's no in and out. You had to be in. Anybody who's, anybody who's not in is out. out. Right. You know, and so you you were expected to train hard. He never said, you guys got to train harder. He just went like, oh, everyone looks so tired. It turned that intensity uh -huh. up. And then you're like, ah, 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 I'm going to die. I'm going to die. You know, and like, but that's the thing. Like, it, it didn't matter. In his dojo, it didn't matter what belt you were wearing. Right. You Everyone smashed everyone, men, women, children, old people. <laughs> and you trained really hard, and there was no excuse. Right. You know, I remember, like, I was training with this really old man. Old, right? He's probably my age now, and I think about <laughs> it. But old, gray hair and all this stuff. And I go to throw Kodagashi on him, and he doesn't really well, go. He didn't take a kemi. And I, I didn't really apply it. And I was just like, hey, uh, are you going to roll out of it or something? 
And the guy goes, oh, and no. falls down. F- finally falls down. And then after the class, since he's like, why didn't you take it to that guy? <laughs> and I go, guy. I go, I don't know. And then says like, you got th- I was third degree black belt at the time. You just give back that third degree black belt if you can't throw that person oh, down. Shit. And I was like, oh, sorry. Right. So yeah. it's like, it was that type of t- type of thing where you had to, you know, constantly be, be pushing yourself. Yeah. No, I, I, that's definitely how it was. But I mean, I, I know you're saying like leading into the test, um, that was a very intense time. It was a very intense time. So I have a question. I mean, for everybody on the on the, on the panel is, um, for people that are listening and maybe they're not from our dojo, like, do any of you or, like or have advice for people that are close to getting their black belt and the dojos are opening back up, like, um, f- for their training or their their mental state or how they should get back into Aikido? Because this is, a, I think, for you know, for our dojo, we're open back up. We're full. We're full mm, contact. Uh, it's really exciting time for everybody. Um, is there uh, a message or a thought? I mean, because I, I think I know all of us at the table are super excited. It's like it's like in California. It's a really exciting time. Well, today's class was a, is the very first class that I've done the full contact, and for me, I was like, "Wow, this is amazing!" The fact that I actually get to be thrown and throw someone else full contact. So my advice to people is get back in there and start training. I'm not saying you got to go gull gung ho and then next two days you're like, oh my God, my back. But get right back in there because once you start training again, it's going to rekindle. Yeah, I know it did for me. I think that I, I, I would see it as more of just like working out in the sense of just getting in a regular rhythm and you know, with all the craziness going on, you know, some training is actually pretty meditative, helpful, in that, in that way where it takes your mind off of the, 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 the daily grind of things and what's going on in the world. And it's, uh, it's an area where you can, I, I feel you perceive it in a way you can have, have training sessions be a bit of a meditation session and find some peace there. Hmm. I would say that <clears throat> people, they should train. Whatever it is you do, just train. Do whatever yeah. you want to do, you should just do. If you lived about 100 years, you would have lived 36,500 days. Wow. If you've lived if you've lived, already lived to be 50, how many of those days are left? Half. Right? Yeah. Half of that. So really there is no time. You know, as you get older, you know, things don't work as well as they used to, you know. You don't have the time, you have more responsibilities. So whatever you do, you have to do it. Yeah. Now's the time. There's if the pandemic taught us anything, it's that time is limited. You For could sure. get the you could get the coronavirus twenty or whatever it is that's coming next, and then you're gone. Right. And like you know that old adage, you know, you never hear people on their deathbed wishing they would wor- have worked more. For sure. Right? And that man, if you want to become good proficient at a martial art, you should train. If you want to improve yourself as a as a human being, you should train. There's no better way to, to develop yourself than martial arts training, whatever martial art it is you do. But there, you have to value your time. There is no time left, right? If you could train one day, you train one day. If you could train 300 days, you train it 300 days, right? If you lived to be, uh, if you lived 100 years, you would only have lived 36,500 days, which you think about that. That's not that many. Nothing, right? So. I think that's a good place to end. Yeah, I think so too. It's been great. Yep. Thank you for listening or watching this podcast. Uh, Don't forget to follow us on social media, like and subscribe to this podcast. Thank you. Mm